So, uh, so that Kent and I didn't basically over, overlap too much, I decided to go a little bit different uh, approach and talk a little bit about the technology that we're using, you know, some of the pros and cons with it, uh, you know, where we can go from here, what are some of the limitations, you know, what are some of the advancements, some, what are some of the things that we really should be looking at, you know, down the road uh, as opportunities. Okay. So, as Kent uh, has already said, basically this technology uh, became official as of January of 2009. It was the official genetic evaluation. Uh, <clears throat> the one thing that's very interesting is that this is really the most rapidly ad adopted strategy in all animal breeding throughout our time. Basically, you know, uh, an idea that was generated in, in uh, uh, 2007 uh, basically, the, the, last, the first genotypes were generated by December of 2007. The first analysis were, was uh, conducted in, in uh, February of 2008, and by uh, March of 2008, animals were already starting to be selected based on genomics, and even though it was a preliminary uh, trial at that particular time. And, and then by January of, of, of 2009, uh, became an official genomic uh, or genetic evaluation. So, so this technology really has advanced quite rapidly, and, and the biggest reason for it is the power, uh, increased accuracy of predicting individuals' true genetics uh, beyond what pedigree information alone uh, provides. The other is the ability to discriminate among individual animals as well as among uh, individual groups. And so that's two very, very powerful uh, uh, technologies or, and techniques that that uh, have come along and uh, have application. What I'll you know give you a little bit of a background of, of what we're really dealing with. The platform that we're using on a genomic scan is this bead chip from Illumina. Uh, here we can we can genotype 12 animals at one time on each chip. Uh, the chips are uh, very unique. There is a software that goes along with the the identif uh, identification of where the SNPs are with, within each of these little strips, and each, each chip is unique. Um, the technology is very, very good. It does, on average, if you have d uh, good quality DNA, you can get over 99% call rates for the individual SNPs. And so uh, and a lot of that is based on the redundancy that uh, Lumina has put into the, the technology uh, we, we say there's 54,000 SNPs across that little strip, but in reality, there, each of those SNPs have been repeated 17 to 20 times randomly across that strip. So if you end up with an air bubble or something like that, when you're processing, you have somewhere else on that particular uh, strip to capture the data. There's also 116 SNPs that can be used as parentage uh, SNPs, although most, not all of those are actually used. <clears throat> Once, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, bead chip is hybridized, you end up with a scanner, and, <clears throat> and it scans the data, and what you end up with is basically these are the little markers across, you know, across the, uh, the strip. Uh, <clears throat> they're like little dots, and they're, you know, they can either, there can either be something there or, or it can be, a, say, an AA or an AB or a BB. <clears throat> that's uh, the, the genotypes that, that's called. Uh, basically, it is a scanned image. You're just scan, uh, scanning the data that's, that's actually uh, generated based on intensity of the, the dots. Uh, <clears throat> this just represents the end of it, the, over on the left-hand side, uh, the individual samples. Uh, and the blue means that they haven't been scanned. The, the green or the green means that they have been scanned, and the orange means that <clears throat> the data has been scanned and it's being verified before it, it goes on. Uh, the the application of this particular information, if a, as a testing lab, you can either submit it to a, a, a source like the USDA and have them generate the genotypes, or you can generate the genotypes themselves and. and and uh, put that information you know, forward. <coughs> we're, uh, we're actually doing both as, as time goes along. Uh, the uh, USDA is actually asking us to, as a testing lab to do more and more. Uh, before the functional genomics lab was generating the genotypes, now they're, uh, they're asking uh, some of the testing labs to, to do the genotyping as well for them instead of just submitting the scan data. Uh, so, so we are providing, the, you know, that as well. 
Uh, this, you know, basically once the information goes to the USDA, then they generate uh, a genomic a PTA. Kent has already talked about that a little bit. But the key components is basically is the increase in accuracy basically for all traits that we're uh, uh, considering, basically genomics versus the, uh, <clears throat> the official information that would come from a pedigree estimate alone. Oftentimes you can double uh, or maybe even uh, more the accuracy of the information. So what does that really mean to us in the industry, whether, whether you're uh, at a bull stud or whether you're, you're on the farm? is that, you know, practical application is that you have a very powerful selection tool that you can use to compare. Sometimes if it's just individuals that are full sibs, you know, basically pedigree information doesn't give you any way to dis uh, distinguish or discriminate, you know, between them, uh, whereas the genomic uh, information does. You know, here's an example which we have three full brothers. Uh, if you take the, the uh, net merit as your trait or as your key trait and just look, some are very close to uh, what the uh, pedigree information would have uh, predicted. And then you can have <clears throat> an individual like Bull, uh, Bull B that's significantly below what, you know, what would have been expected from pedigree information. So that's a selection a criteria that you can quickly use, whether the animal's at a day of age or whether he's much older. And so... So you have a management tool to look that. You can uh, go that way. If you want to look at productive life, you can do the same type of thing. Uh, even if there's just two sibs, uh, full sibs, you know, again, you may have a, an individual that's very close, like in bull one in the second group, uh, to what the pedigree estimates, but then you can have a full brother that's significantly higher, you know, than uh, what you could have had. You know, and the, you know the, the situation here is that, you know, in the past, we could have picked any of these individuals to put into a, an AI program, uh, but now we have the power to start to sort amongst them and decide whether or not we want to go this way or, or to just to pass. And, it, you know, not always we have a choice, and I think that's the other thing that you, you need to be aware of, that whether it's males or, or females, uh, and look at, looking at the genomic information, sometimes... It, neither animal uh, is uh, equal to the pedigree information uh, and predictions as well. So they may both be significantly lower than what the pedigree estimates would indicate themselves. So, so it is a very powerful tool, especially among full sibs. But I think another important thing, even if you have a single individual, what's, what's important is that you can use the same technology to get an estimate of it, are they at what the pedigree information would predict or are they much higher or much lower. So, so there's some practical applications there as well. So, so when you put it into a breeding program, whether it's an AI or whether it's uh, on the farm, you know, the biggest thing that we can start to look at is the, the improvement in the in, individual's uh, particular uh, uh, an estimate of how good or bad they are prior to going into any pr uh, progeny testing if it's a bull or performance testing if it's a cow. Uh, you know, the, the, one of the limitations of this particular technology is basically focusing on additive genetics. And so basically the non-additive components, you know, that you would often see through epistasis as, as well as other uh, non-additive uh, factors uh, really is not contributed or not included in this particular technology at this point in time. So, so we are somewhat limited as to what kind of genes and what kind of capture that, that we have. Uh, and so that does somewhat limit the information that's available to us. <clears throat> the, the one flip side of it from the standpoint of a bull stud is that as, as all of the bull studs are basically have applied this technology to their young sire programs, the, the real plus side of it is that basically the bottom 35% of the bulls that would have went into an AI program are no longer available. They're, they're eliminated immediately and never come into a program. So that's a significant uh, gain from the standpoint of the average uh, genetic merit of individuals. So, that, so as a, a farmer that's uh, using young sires in their, pro, in their herd, you know, the big advantage is the overall average genetic gain uh, that they have in those young bulls is significantly increased. So, so it's a real win-win situation from them because they're basically those bottom 
35% of the bulls that could have been used are, are eliminated. The other opportunity, and we'll have to see, you know, where this goes. You know, progeny testing is very expensive uh, and timely and, and costly. You know, some organizations have, you know, considered uh, either limiting progeny testing or eliminating it. I, I think, you know, a lot of this will depend upon, you know, how successful or where this really goes is the, the <clears throat> increased accuracy of the information. If people like uh, can't work and, and other, others can increase the accuracy beyond this, you know, 65, 70 percent, you know, level on up to, say, 85 or even 90 percent, you'll see a significant uh, shift in, in progeny testing and, and performance testing. The other opportunity within our uh, uh, industry is uh, basically a restructure of management and even marketing programs. And when I, what I'm talking about there is that basically, Kent's already alluded to that, is that certain young bulls are already not just being collected, sampled, and put back onto the shelf. But we're continuing to collect those animals. They're being used in programs right along. And you know, one of the biggest problems in the past with AI is that a bull's best semen production years, he's sitting on the shelf. You know, he comes in, he's, you know, he's sampled or collected or about a year of age. That semen goes out and is used to impregnate cows, and then those heifers have to grow up and, and uh, become pregnant and start to produce. So there's at least a four-year window of time uh, that the bull's sitting around doing nothing. And, and basically his optimum uh, semen production years is during that waiting period. So there's, there, there's a, a, a possibility of restructuring, you know, how we manage, how we house, how we uh, um, look at, at bulls. The same type of thing uh, is in marketing. You basically, some of these animals will be marketed right on through and actually have their own progeny testing uh, programs themselves and actually not go through a formal procedure. The other thing that you'll actually uh, potentially see is because we know more about these individuals, is that you're going to see younger and younger animals used as parents. And that, that's from the standpoint of, of females as well as males. I mean, you do have an opportunity actually to use a virgin heifer to, to be a, a mother at some point in time with some of the reproductive techniques to, to capture eggs and, and go that way. So, so there are a lot of opportunities from, from that standpoint. One of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about today is a, is a testing lab is some of the technology and, and the, you know, the information is only as good as what you get and, you know, and how, it's, how is it applied. You know, the, the basic uh, genome scans are this, this uh, bead chip, which are these little dots, they're little three micron dots. Each of those dots are an individual uh, uh, marker. And, and then here's another type of technology that we use, which is a glass bead which is, has a holographic uh, code in it and you can actually hybridize to that and it's oftentimes used in some of your low chip uh, uh, types of situation uh, and it works very well for there. You know, Kent had indicated that there's uh, the current platform is around 50,000 uh, markers. I can tell you right now there's a, the platform that's underway is to go to 300 to 400,000 markers, you know, using this type of uh, technology, you know, basically to capture more information. So from the standpoint of a lab and from the standpoint of somebody that's actually submitting a sample for <coughs> uh, genomic evaluations, there's some things that I think it's important for you to know is that basically to, <coughs> to really get a genomic uh, estimate, you need you know, some basic sample ID information, which means, you know, breed code, country code, and by country codes, with some of the, the individual states having codes, you know, we, they have actually act as country codes, and then the regular uh, ID number, and then as well as sex. I can tell you right now, it's amazing how many animals that actually come in to, for testing that end up being registered or identified as a wrong sex. And so this particular technology that we use, that is one of the things that is checked uh, to, set, uh, to verify that if it's a male, it actually is a male and not a female, those types of things. So uh, the siren dam ID has to be there as, as well as uh, information on date of birth. Uh, one of the things I'll talk about is uh, how, what affects the quality of inf uh, information that uh, we get out of this technology is the DNA itself and the DNA extraction. Basically, what you want to have is the best quality of DNA that you can have. It's free of inhibitors, 
and we, we will go. Uh, it, it can be used from there. Uh, one of the most common types of samples that we get in are blood samples, and, and they need to be in a, a, a tube that that uh, has an anticoagulant, either a purple top, a blue, or a green top tube, not the red. You know, we don't want a big clot because uh, basically what we end up with, even though we can get DNA out of that, it ends up being a sheer DNA. The other thing about blood is that, you know, primarily it comes from the white blood cells, but there are other nucleated cells within the blood that we use and, or can uh, isolate DNA from. You know, blood samples are very easy to, to uh, isolate DNA. It's probably one of the most easy uh, source to, to do that. But one of the problems that we run into from a practical standpoint are twins. Uh, with uh, whether it's a male male female female or a male female twin, basically about 90% of those animals will not be identical. And so, you, when since you have a really good chance that those uh, placentas will fuse, you'll have transfer back and forth between the two uh, t twins. You end up with stem cells from the other twin that be, uh, that actually migrates across, and those stem cells do become a permanent fixture within that animal. So. And so they'll go ahead and go under, undergo cell division and continue to uh, divide. Uh, the problem with that is that it's basically the same thing as contaminating the sample. You know, so if, and so, so if it's a twin, you have to go with a different DNA source if you're going to do a genomic test or really any other type of DNA test. So, you know, we oftentimes we think about this just from the standpoint of, of free martins, but uh, again, if it's a male male or female female, the same type of situation occurs. About 90% of those will end up being chimerics, and you see the, the genotype of the, of the twin. Hair is another common uh, material that's sent in. We only get the, the DNA from the root and the attached uh, epithelial cells that come along, uh, not from the shaft. And the biggest problem with hair is that, especially in the genomic scans, is the keratin, you have to remove it from the DNA itself. If you don't, it actually interferes with the process and you can end up with, with really poor results as a result of that. So you need to remove this. You know, hair is one of those things that's convenient for people to, to provide, but I can tell you right now, the samples coming in with dingleberries hanging on them is not the most attractive samples. Uh, and also you run in the, the, the risk of basically contamination from the manure that that comes along as well as the inhibitors. So the, the other type of material that of, oftentimes the bull studs deal with are basically the sperm cells. You know, it's, really it's the most difficult cell type to actually use. It is a very good quality DNA. Uh, and although we're, we're, if you're in a forensic lab or, so, you know, or something like that, you know, the capability to actually differentiate between the sperm cells and the epithelial cells could be a very useful tool. Uh, it's not really a problem, and it's one of those things, unless you have a really poor lab as far as, you know, extracting DNA. If, if there are other cells, either from the extenders or whatever, that, uh, <clears throat> that are non-sperm cells, and they do a poor job of extracting, they can actually end up with DNA from an outside source. So, but, <clears throat> you know, sperm DNA is, is also a very good sample to, to use. What I wanted to show you here is basically what happens when you you end up with samples that end up being twins. And what, what, uh, what we have normally is we'll have this, the, uh, the three categories that you normally see, the AAs, ABs, and the BBs. But these green dots that show in between are actually <coughs> examples of a twin in which they, they don't have an identical genotype, so, so they tend to migrate in between the genotypes that you would normally have. And so, so basically they're, they're showing that this is a contaminated sample or a sample that will end up with poor call rates. And if it has a poor call rate, you know, basically anything less than 90%, the USDA can't use that particular data. One of the things I guess I would like to kind of echo what uh, Kent has talked about is basically tracking inheritance. I think that's one of the opportunities in the future that will be very, very useful to us. You know, traditionally we think of, you know, 50% of information coming from, a, from parents, and so you'd have an equal amount. But the reality is when you start to look at DNA and start to track the patterns while it's inherited either by, via chromosome or a, a group of chromosomes or whatever, what you end up with is that individuals can actually inherit 
you know, like in this particular case, more than 50% uh, from a particular parent. Now, there's some value in that is that, you know, if, as Kent had already mentioned from the standpoint of uh, inbreeding and that type of thing, we can actually use this technology to give us a better uh, idea of how inbred or how much uh, inbreeding actually is within an animal. And so, so we can get a better measure than our traditional uh, models that we use on inbreeding. And so, so it does give us that opportunity. It also gives us an opportunity to track what's actually coming from, from individuals. And so the bottom line on this is that instead of an animal being 50-50 or receiving 50% uh, you know, from uh, each of its parents, it may end up with a, a 40% from one uh, parent or 60% from the other parent. So, so they may be more alike than you actually thought they would be. And the same thing would happen for full sibs. Uh, they may be more alike than you, the pedigree information alone would suggest. One of the other, the other things that we need to look at in, in the technologies areas and that type of thing is that really what's going on. I mean, like I, well, what we've already mentioned, this technology has been one of the most rapidly adapted technologies uh, in our programs. But how do we interpret the data? What's really there? There's basically a very few labs that are generating this data. There's not a lot of people looking at the actual data itself. And, you know, how that data is interpreted, you know, could lead to different conclusions as to what's going on. So, so data interpretation of the current platforms plus any future platforms could be very uh, useful. Mutation rates, you know, what are they? I mean, are, are they really the same? as we expected, are they different within different families? Are they different within different breeds? You know, how does this technology, how does the current technology, you know, treat individual uh, breeds and individual families? Is it equal? Uh, will the future technologies also have the same problems or will we we'll be able to uh, get significant advancements? And, you know, basically, you know, does the SAR use, the SAR families use, how does that affect you know, what we're dealing with, and also as we add additional breeds, you know, what effects do you see? What I'd like to do is just show you a few slides, and this is the stuff that Kent doesn't see. He, he just, you know, the, the genotypes come to him, but it's, it's some real-world data and, and what happens with some of the software and depending upon what, what's uh, dealt with. Here we have, you know, three genotypes for an individual SNP that that's uh, used in the, the panel that is used for genomic evaluations. We, we actually three, we see the three populations of animals, but we actually see two uh, BB groups here. And these little X's and O's actually represent uh, child parent errors that are showing up. And in this particular group, if you actually shove the zero over the little target area over, and so you just uh, collect it as far uh, right population of animals, you eliminate all those child parent errors. And so the question is that, you know, this suggests that there's actually an underlying deletion or mutation in that particular piece of DNA nearby uh, for this one particular probe in the technology. So, so it, it recognizes that uh, the software recognizes it as an AA, AB, and BB, but there's really two BBs in, in this particular uh, group. Here's another example. What we oftentimes see is that we actually have a whole lot of things going on. We have two AB groups. Looks like we've got two AA groups. There could be two BBs, and then we've got a group of animals that just fall out and don't even work at all. And so, so what's unique about those? What's different? I mean, if we're looking for a genetic defect or if we're looking for or some other type of specific trait, you know, this type of information may be very, very valuable to us. Uh, from, from the calculation of genomic uh, estimates, you know, here's a situation where they're going to get called as AAABs and, and BBs, and, and that's what, you know, Kent would have. But the reality is that if there's actually two AAs, you know, it should be instead of a, if A was zero, it should be a, a zero and a zero minus, you know, type of thing. So there, there should be an extra genotype uh, provided because, you know, are they actually e equivalent? Um, same type of thing here. You see it a little bit more. There's definitely a different BB group. There's definitely two uh, a, a B groups that's showing up. And like I said, there is a significant number of the, the markers that are in the panel that actually shows this type of this uh, information. And so what, what's key to it is that basically it's, 
it's saying that there is a lot of genetic variation going on in the DNA itself, either from the standpoint of technology areas, and either mutations or deletions. You know, on a single base uh, deletion, you know, can be very important. You know, most of the markers that are in these panels are not in express sequences, so they're not actually not in genes. It's just basically they're, they're all linked markers. They're outside, and so they're tied to, to potential other genes. But that, but that linkage relationship uh, could be extremely important. Here's another slide in which we basically have you know, the three genotypes as you'd expect, but then we would have a group of animals over here that fall outside of the call ranges, and the call ranges would be in these shaded areas. And it's interesting that you know, this, ha this group of animals that show up are, are all Jerseys. And so, you know, as we started to introduce other breeds such as Jerseys and, and Brown Swiss, we're starting to see some of this fallout. These animals wouldn't get a genotype. You know, they would be a no-call in that particular case. And so, so, so is that, you know, is there a biological function to this? We don't know. I mean, but it does, you know, start to raise some questions. Is there something there that we should be looking at? Now, here's another example of the same type of thing. These are actually jerseys and brown swiss that fall out, you know, fall outside of the tradition, uh, traditional call areas. So, and then here's one final example in which we basically, we clearly have uh, two homozygous groups that have two populations. <coughs> Excuse me. They have two populations of animals that, that are showing up. So... <coughs> So I, I think what I want to conclude with is that the technology is extremely powerful and it's, and it's very useful, but there's still a whole lot that we need to learn and, and need to understand in this area, not only from the standpoint of how you analyze the data, but also what the data is itself. You know, how useful is it? Do we really have just the three, three, co or three codes or do we have five codes? Do we have six codes that we should be genotyping these animals with? Uh, you know, it, or should we just eliminate those ones that are the oddball, you know, information or the oddball SNPs and just not include it? If it doesn't fit an ideal pattern, and we don't, uh, we don't include that. The problem with that is that there may be a biological function associated with that, and as such, you know, we're losing a bunch of information. Now, <clears throat> the technology, you know, works very, very well. Uh, we're always going to see some of this. But, I mean, I think we have to understand what some of the limitations are and what are some of the opportunities uh, as we go forward.